Thank you all for joining us for week five of the six weeks of Make It Okay series. The topic today is the arts and Make It Okay. And we have four panelists who I'm really excited to hear from. Uh, we had a really great conversation already earlier this week. And um, I think you'll all appreciate uh, what they have to say. So diverse perspectives from different um, realms of the arts and uh, creative spaces here in our community. So what is Make It Okay? Make It Okay is an anti-stigma campaign that was created to encourage individuals to talk more openly about mental illness. And by breaking the silence, we can help friends, neighbors, loved ones, and team members feel understood and supported. Um, Make It Okay was brought to Iowa from Minnesota by Iowa Healthy Estate Initiative uh, under the leadership of Jamie Habrell, uh, who many of you may know. She's moderating our panel next week. Um, but within Make It Okay, there are various opportunities to learn, engage, talk, share. So um, visit their website, makeitokay.org.iowa, and you can find out kind of all the ways to connect. There's a pledge you can take. You can become an ambassador, um, register your workplace, or more. And I know they did a digital training yesterday, I think, in Lynn County and um, had great participation, it looks like. So it is statewide, um, and there's resources for people in Des Moines and beyond. Just a quick hit at the Make It Okay sponsors who um, enable the program to thrive, some logos you likely recognize, and then the community partners who help make this happen. Um, Healthy State Initiative, the Iowa Health Foundation, Capital Crossroads, Greater Des Moines Partnership. Um, Meg Schneider, who was on this call, was a driving force and really came um, to the small group of us with this idea for this series. So thanks, Meg. It's been really, I think, meaningful um, to have these conversations. Um, and then Business Publications Corporation, uh, just a shout out to them because they continue with the Lifting the Veil series, which is focused on mental health and had a series this spring of, um, I wanna say it was four or even six sessions and are doing another one this fall that starts kind of right after this one ends um, in October. Uh, so check out Lifting the Veil and all the work that they're doing um, around mental health and mental illness as well. Um, I'm Emily Kessinger with Capital Crossroads and I'm moderating today's panel, but you're all here to hear from the panel. So um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and we'll start with Christine, but um, panelists, just tell us about you and really what, what does life look like for you lately? So Christine, hi. Oh, well, you're muted. Dang, man, I keep doing that. All right. We all do. We're with you. These virtual meetings are so fun. It just reminds me how I need to practice mindfulness a little bit more sometimes. Um, my name is Christine Herr. I serve as executive director for Art Force Iowa. And Art Force Iowa is a nonprofit here in Des Moines with the mission to transform youth and youth through art. Man, I don't know. The last six months have been an interesting roller coaster from having those oh shit moments to then being like okay i know what i'm doing i can do this today's okay today's not a bad day um and then to you know working with young people it's just like everything is so urgent for young people there's this urgency to make sure that um you know they're they're getting what they need during this time but all in all i i feel I feel good that the last six months have provided an opportunity for myself and my staff to really relook and rethink on what self-care looks like as an organization. Um, COVID has helped us to really slow down and that's something that we've never had before. So the last six months, it's just been a roller coaster with a lot of moments of rest and really recognizing that self-care is so important for um, sustaining ourselves. So that's what it looks like for us and for me. Christine, can you tell us too a little bit because um, I got to know you just through this process, right, virtually, but give us a little bit about you and your background. Um, I just yeah, growing okay. up here and uh, yeah. how you ended up at, at Art Force before we move on to Monica. Absolutely. So I was born and raised in Des Moines, Iowa. My parents came as refugees in the late 70s. Um, they came from Laos, and I am a Hmong American. Graduated from East High School, did 
didn't want to go to college. I wanted to be a singer, songwriter. And my parents were like, girl, you better not. That is not what you're supposed to be doing. You better not be pulling any of that. We didn't, you know, swim across this huge ass lake for you to become an artist where you're not going to get paid. So you better go and, you know, make something out of yourself by becoming a doctor or a lawyer. Um, but, you know, I rebelled and I said I would go for biochem cell molecular biology at Drake and then ended up changing my degree to philosophy, creative writing and political science. Um, parents were not thrilled, but I think they started to understand that my purpose was always going to drive me more than anything else. Um, but that led me to Art Force Iowa. I've been on a lot of adventures, working at several different jobs, whether it was being at a market research firm and finding out what type of depends people prefer over others, to working at the Des Moines Register and Juice Magazine and being an editor and a writer, um, to doing all of the events for the newsroom, and then being an artist mentor at Art Force Iowa, which led me to also um, grow here to be executive director. And I feel very honored and very lucky to um, have this experience and to share space with people in all different kinds of industries. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I got to Art Force. That's how I landed in Des Moines. I guess I, I never really left. So I, I kind of stayed here and left for a little bit, but always came back. Um, yeah, I'm a singer, songwriter, musician not trained or classically taught. Um, everything was done at home in the middle of the night where my mom and dad wouldn't hear me play because they were very not happy with me learning how to play. Um, but music has been the one thing and, and songwriting has been the one thing that has helped me um, to choose to stay in those moments of depression and suicide. So art has been such an important role for me and to now be executive director working with young people who battle depression and suicide and helping them see that you can choose to stay by using your art and modeling that for them um it's really cool i feel really Thanks. honest yeah i appreciate you sharing and i just think that context for the group um is important so cool yeah thanks for that yeah, Monica, what about you? Tell us about you and what life looks like for you lately when you're not in the pantry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So I am Monica. I'm a mom of two and I live in Ames, Iowa, which is a place that I can't seem to like leave. I keep coming back here even if I move across the country <laughs> twice. <laughs> um so yeah, we live here. I love it. I started a new job during all this as a user experience researcher, um, which is a really strange experience to start a new job working from home and never having seen anyone that you like that you're working with. <laughs> um, but it's been really awesome. I, I love the job. Um, I'm also an artist. I I kind of jump around between things. I love drawing and I love photography and I love painting and I love to kind of mix them all together. Um, yeah, that's me in a little short <laughs> description. So for life lately, like over the last six months, I mean, it has to be, you know, you, you were doing online arts education, right? Before. Um, so what made you pivot? Um, was it just change or? you know, why make that change? It was kind of a random chance opportunity that someone just contacted me and because of, they knew someone who worked at the place and um, it just, I'm assuming you're referring to the job change. Um, but yeah, it was just a random chance thing where if someone ended up contacting me, I was like, this sounds like a lot of fun. And it is what I went to graduate school for. So it's not like a huge um, jump but um, it just felt like a good time to, to spend some time doing what I went to grad school for because I haven't done it since then. So, um, yeah. Nice, cool, thanks. Matt, what about you? Well, uh, I'm Matt Greiner. Um, I spend most of my professional life these days as the director of Group Creative Services, which is a public art consultancy. Um, 
I tend to operate from firmly held convictions and deep passions in most things that I do. And um, one of the things that I'm most excited about uh, kind of consistently for many years is just that art can and should provide um, greater experiences and connecting us to ideas, to broader perspectives and to our neighbors. Um, and so uh, advancing art in the public sphere, especially in ways that relate to um, community engagement or fostering better civic dialogue, just helping us get along with the people that we live with um, next door is um, something that I, I work about work on all the time. Um, I'm, a, I'm a parent, I have two kids. Um, I've been very fortunate through this time. I'm also a maker, I'm an artist. I got my bachelor's degree as an artist from Drake University. I did some graduate study and studio work at Northwestern in Chicago. Um, like pretty much everybody I think we're hearing from, I keep trying to move away and just end up coming back, um, which has a lot of great value, I think. I'm, I'm pleased that that's been my experience. Um, but you know, in our earlier conversation this week, we started to get to the idea that there are many layers in our lives and that there are a lot of things that inform us. And I think I'm very fortunate uh, in many ways, but in part that uh, creative activities and making are things that are part of my life in all of those layers. So they're part of how I relate to my children, to my significant other, um, most of my time during this pandemic has very fortunately been spent building one of as far as I can tell, one of the most elaborate chicken coops in the city of Des Moines, which I'm very pleased with. Um, <clears throat> and that's brought me a lot of meaning, as well as, uh, um, I think, some insight into ways to be resilient and overcome and kind of learn. There's been a lot of learning involved. Um, and, uh, you know, I think another thing that's been apparent to me in, in this experience has been both an awareness of how important it is to have access to outside spaces and the respite that nature provides. Um, and also, you know, all of these things, it, it's almost like we're here talking about this in part just because the pandemic experience has heightened our awareness and our reflectiveness seems to be at the forefront of so many people's experiences in whatever their current situation is. Um, and so, I don't know, I'm kind of an introspective person anyway. I tend to sit around thinking about things a lot. Um, but I, I find that it's easier to share that with others and also to hear other people's experiences. And that's a really lovely way to connect with other people and to feel like um, social needs can still be met. Really good Maybe, point. Yeah, to wrap up, we've got, you know, professionally, we've got a couple projects that I'm really proud of. Some of the things that are happening um, in the metro region that we may touch on later, but a lot of them relate to some of these issues as well, demonstrating how art can have impact on um, social needs as well as uh, environmental concerns. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I wrote down something you said earlier that I definitely want to revisit. Um, but before that, and then we'll go there, I want to turn it over to Christina to tell us a little bit about you and your work and what life looks like for you lately. Hi, I'm Christina Smith. Thanks for having me. Um, I uh, live in West Des Moines with my husband and my son, Seth. He's 10. Um, I also have a daughter, Ashley, who's 22. She um, is studying art and psychology at Drake right now. Um, Right now, um, I, um, well, I've uh, supported and advocated uh, for individuals with mental health issues and disabilities probably close to 30 years. Um, right now, I am, been, I am the exec, uh, executive director of Community Support Advocates um, and have been that for the last 11 years. Um, that is a nonprofit um, organization that supports about 1,900 individuals um, with disabilities or mental health issues and, and just a number of different ways of living, in, in, living independently and getting services that they need. Um, 
also about 16 years ago, um, I founded um, Community Sport Advocates Momentum Art Program. So that is a free art um, studio that provides, you know, studio space, supplies, um, mentorship training to anyone in Central Iowa who has, um, who identifies as having any kind of disability, mental health issue, or it just needs art access, basically. And that's located there at Mainframe Studios um, downtown. Um, I wouldn't say that I am an artist per se, but I definitely am surrounded by creatives. My husband and both my kids love art um, and I um, surround myself with art whenever I can um, believe holistically in the value of art um, in our own process of recovering, right? Um, what does my life look like right now? Personally, um, both my kiddos, um, have had transplants so that's kind of an unusual thing about me um and our family and so they that of course ha has them both have some pretty significant medical issues and and risks so you know i just live with that you know mom anxiety of like wishing to be able to put them in a bubble <laughs> and so i live with like an ongoing anxiety of how to like keep them safe which annoys them of course so i have to deal with my own anxiety about that um professionally i feel like like kind of what Christine was talking about, this roller coaster that you can't get off. But um, mainly I spend a lot of my time trying to find funding because mental health and art funding is like nowhere. <laughs> and, you know, these programs are so vital right now. And I, you know, literally there's just, um, it, it's very sad and so critical for those people, for individuals that we're serving. And um, so I feel like I spent a lot of my time just, you know, pulling out my hair, trying to figure out or making it go gray, actually, um, trying to figure out how to fund it. Um, but, um, you know, really though, right now, I am really super busy in a good way because we're in the process of putting a show together. We, um, and I'll, I'll stick the link in, in the chat if that's okay. We're um, putting together an exhibition um, featuring artists, actually 34 artists with disabilities or mental health issues, and it's gonna launch virtually on October 1st. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited. So this is the first year, it's their 16th year. It's the first year it'll be virtually, and then it'll actually be in person. You can come see it if you come to Mainframe Studios um, first Friday on October 2nd. And so it's kind of, I mean, it's been kind of fun to put it together, but we have to do an in-person and virtual kind of process and then figure out how to do it safely. And so it's kind of like doing two, like two completely different things. Um, so it's been a lot of work, but it, so but that's like happy work, right? Um, the the happy kind of craziness that goes along with trying to put a show together, but the work is fantastic, and I've been really, um, and a lot of it is COVID inspired, and just kind of the just really like, oh, uh, that we're all experiencing, and I you know I just have loved to see the growth that's that's happened, and and so that's been fun, but but busy, totally busy. So yeah, please share that link. Um... And that's being led by the Momentum. It's a Momentum art show. Yes, the Momentum okay. program is putting that together. Great. So I, I want to go back to something Matt kind of hinted at, and Christina, you talked about um, as well. But so arts is a as a means for relationship building and connecting and the social impact angle. I mean, um, Christine, Christina, and Matt especially, um, you're working within um, organizations or working with cities where this is sort of their the goal right is to have the art have arts drive your work so how has that changed what has been hard for you um i mean during covid and i, I know some of the answers because we talked about them already but for the group you know um and anyone can start and we'll round table christina do you want to go first yeah, I can. Um, so for us, so momentum is designed right to um, bring people together. And so you've got we've got these, you know, groups of people. I'm sorry, they decided to mow like right now. So I'm so sorry <laughs> if you can hear that. I apologize. But um, so um, bringing these groups of these beautiful groups of people together to work collaboratively. And that's like what we do. And it, almost as important as the art is the community that it builds. Right. And so, and I, Christine, I'm sure you're the same thing, the same way. Right. And, and the first, like right away we had to close down. Not only did we have to close down for safety, but we got shut down by mandate. Right. Because that's kind of, we fell into that category and, and that was okay. But um, we had a really hard time 
getting back open. We actually just opened in August, and but we had to completely redesign how we did things because our studio space is really small. And, um, and sometimes, and it's dropping. So sometimes 20, 25 people show up, which was fine before, but you can't do that with people with disabilities and known, you know, known issues, right? Uh, you know, health issues and then sharing supplies, you know? And so we just, you know, we had to completely redesign how we were providing services. And the thing is, is that for, for you and I, I mean, for, you know, the general community, Isolation is something that has just been overwhelming to us to experience, but folks with mental health issues are already isolated. And then you compound that and, you know, it's just been devastating. And, and you know, and we can talk about this later, but one of the things that we really touched on when our conversation earlier this week is that community built resiliency. And when, you know, one of the things is that, you know, we will, it research shows that if we are part of a community, we will act more resilient. But what happens when the community disappears? And so I'm, you know, and so it's been very, very challenging to how do we rebuild these communities, not only for folks, I mean, for folks with mental health issues, but just for the rest of us and how does that impact our, our mental health? And so um, that just is part of the start of the conversation. I'll let other people join in. Yeah, I, I agree with Christina. Um, you know, when you look at a resiliency model, it requires people. It demands for community. You can't just go out there and, and build your own resiliency on your own. Surely, you know, having the will to move forward is important, but it does require community. And I mean, I, I would say similar things, you know, we, we stopped programming the first week of March and went completely virtual. Um, and for those of you who don't know Art Force Iowa, our history and who we serve, we work with young people between the ages of 12 to 19 who are either court involved through juvenile court or family court um, and young people who are labeled as bad and disruptive in the classroom. And we also serve refugee and immigrant youth. So for us, this community, it's actually the, the priority of what we do. Our mission is to transform youth and need through art and we get to use art as this amazing tool to help young people recognize how they feel and then regulate how they feel. But this community aspect is key. And for us, it was figuring out how do we move this virtually and still have this kind of intimacy um, where our kids can still talk to us about things like their periods or their bowel movements, or, oh my gosh, this happened in school today, and I got into this fight with my best friend. It, it was really difficult um, to figure out how to still have that space in this virtual world, but somehow we were able to still maintain that kind of level of intimacy and, and create art together, um, and we've been doing it since March, and in March, no, in, in about April, we launched Artful Connections where we invited the community to join us because it's just like what you said, Christina, like we're all in isolation. This sucks not being able to like see people and hug people. And so when you put that up with already feeling depressed and already having these suicidal thoughts, it's even more, more difficult, right? Um, and to feel even more siloed in. And we wanted to invite the community to join us in making art because we knew that everyone was afraid and, and scared. And I think what was difficult for our community was, what does it look like for the next couple of years? Um, because our community has been hit super hard. Over 75% of our kids and their families have been exposed or tested positive. So that meant we had to keep everyone safe um, and how do we do that? And we had to make this decision that, you know what, we're not going to have any in-person workshops and we're going to have to keep testing these virtual workshops. And thankfully, you know, I think whenever you're honest with people, regardless of their age, if you can be transparent and just say, hey, yo, we're doing something completely new. We have no idea what we're doing. We don't know if this is going to work and we're going to do it with you. We're going to learn this together because we are in this together. So Let's make sure that if it's not working for you, you let me know and we'll change this virtual workshop. So we originally had all of our virtual workshops with our youth through Facebook because that was the easiest way to 
meet them online and connect with them. And then we found out that, you know what, let's teach them some soft skills and get them ready for the workforce by making them all create a Gmail account, sending them calendar invites, and now they're gonna meet us on Google Meet. And it's been really interesting to see young people come back week after week and, and accept the invitation or not accept it and say, I can't come because I have to do this. And so not only have we been able to continue to create art together as a collective, we've been able to help teach them some soft skills, um, but our force is in a very unique situation that every trauma our organization has ever gone through has really set us up to be prepared for COVID. And when I mean the organization has gone through trauma, I, I legitimately mean that we had three executive directors transition in nine months. Um, 10 months after the third executive director, which was me, we had a two foot flood that destroyed $90,000 plus worth of art supplies. Um, and then we were without running water during our month long art exhibit. Then six months after that, we had a move from 5,000 square feet to a 1,200 square feet building, um, which we now are in the Des Moines Social Club. So I think every everything that we've gone through as an organization and having the youth follow us and, and build community with our young people, it's been able to help us pivot and still have this space to create art online, but it's difficult. Um, and I think we all worry on when can we see each other again and when can that be safe? And those are things that you know, I don't think anyone has any answers to. I know one of the things we talked about, because we went online too, um, and uh, which was really interesting for us because we got a, actually a whole new set of audience. Um, because, you know, it's like anybody, you know, who identifies with having a disability or health issue, well, that's, you know, that's me, you know, that's anybody, right? All, all of us, you know, um, lots of us can, can qualify for that. Um, and so we got a whole new set of um, like hundreds of people joined us, but it wasn't the people who we were serving before pre-COVID. Um, and the, the issue was, is, and, and it totally makes sense, is that the people we were serving pre-COVID um, were well below the, uh, the poverty line, right? Um, and most, uh, many fought, you know, struggle with homelessness and those kinds of things. And so, you know, they don't, they don't have access to, um, to stable internet and they don't have access to devices. And, and even if they did, um, you know, they, they just, you know, minute by minute and then, and then, it, and then access to free Wi-Fi. but then you, it's not like you can go hang out at a coffee shop anymore, you know, <laughs> because, you know, there's, there's none of that available. And so then we had to kind of go person by person, try to access and, and, and it just really wasn't that, that, that digital divide was just even further. So the things that you and I are using to build community, they don't have. And so that just took even a whole nother, um, now the school system, you know, because they all have to have the kiddos that, that we serve are finding that they have access more so because, you know, the schools have to provide that, right, are, are, are at least working towards that, they're struggling too, but, um, you know, you know, a 45 year old homeless man's not, you know, no one's trying to provide <laughs> him access, right, um, so those are the things that we're, you know, that, that's just really struggling to get access in a digital in, in where we're all communicating digitally. So um, that's been a huge challenge for us. Yeah, and that's an ongoing discussion with all levels, right? I mean, the access for people that are working, kids from that are in school. And so I, I think there's some good momentum. I feel positive about the tra trajectory from some of the work that um, organizations are doing to figure out how we can bridge gaps. So. But Christine, you guys are super resilient. That's all of those things leading up to this. So they make you well, well prepared for sure. It's crazy, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, Matt, what do you think from, from your perspective and working within, you know, regional governments and with cities? And you're on mute before you try to talk. I saw you gearing up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, um, fortunately, we have different challenges, and I do often believe that uh, one of the things that the arts offers are new and interesting ways to meet challenges. We're hearing some of, you know, kind of unfortunate and extreme examples of where that is running into its limits. Um, our, our 
difficulties have not been nearly so severe. Um, we just have concerns about making sure that we're getting good community input, which, you know, I think one of our recent planning efforts meant that the follow-up surveys needed to be primarily conducted as online surveys. And so we put some effort into making sure that they were written creatively to get some better input and distributed with strategy. Um, we're, it's, it's nice now um, as we're beginning some new processes like that, that we're finding that we're able to do uh, in-person meetings outside, at least until Iowa weather decides to turn into winter, should it decide to do that this year. Um, and uh, I think actually that's one of the things that we've started to recognize is that having those accesses to outdoor spaces is so critical, not only for individual needs where it really is very apparent, but also for larger needs, professional and uh, you know meeting spaces. Just the ability to go have a meeting at a park is almost, it, it, it's kind of like a moment of necessity today and yet, if I think back eight months ago, it would have been something of a luxury, right? And I, I hope that's one of the things that we can decide to carry forward with us. Um, I, I know we talked a little bit uh, earlier about how some of that has evolved into different types of practice. Um, my own experiences were that I started to, throughout the period of the, the pandemic so far, I started to get to places where I was really quite, um, it was hard for me to want to be in any, even to go grocery shopping, just because people would stand too close or you know dive in front of me to get the box of cereal or something. And I was kind of like, no, I've got my mask, get your mask away. And to go to meetings, I, I do most of my work. I so enjoy meeting people and talking with people and hearing about what's on their minds and on, you know, recently as we've started to do limited like outdoor in-person meetings, on my way there, I have to remind myself how much I value that because I get so anxious and concerned about the health issues, the safety issues, or even outside of that, I maybe am just feeling out of practice in a way where I kind of, I'm used to and comfortable being in my little space here where I am with the people that are familiar with to, to me that I see every day. And so um, just being comfortable, seeing people in person is something that I, I worry about for how uh, we may re-enter uh, hopefully someday in the future to having a greater, fuller social experience. I do also really wish more to have, um, I don't know what this would look like, but because things like public outdoor spaces have become so valuable in ways that we're much more aware of. Um, I really desire to see ways for cultural activities or art or um, just other like individual expressions to help us connect to one another in ways that are safe. It feels to me like the things that we have as cultural artifacts, the things that we do as personal like even if you just think about like the cairns, like stacked rocks that people use on trails or something, or um, you know, graffiti that I might see on Jersey blocks when I'm on a, a trail. Um, you know, I, I kind of long for that to become something that is a bit more intentional. Um, I really love the things that happen in the neighborhoods where people are like making scavenger hunts or having things in their windows like how many bears can you find um you know i think somebody in, in my neighborhood had uh, like a lost dog poster but it was a giraffe like a picture of a giraffe it just like cracked me up i had to take my kids like let's go see if we can find the giraffe right i mean no giraffe to be found but it gave us something to do for the day and i think things like that are the things that help us without needing to even be like a direct thing, like now I know you and we're friends, but like that's a social connection. That's the, to me, that's kind of the mechanism in which art and culture can connect us to each other or in a different way to ideas, right? That's, that's how we, we start to connect emotionally somehow through some of these like little things. And even if it is just like the sign that says we're in it together, it's easy to walk past that all the time and just think it's like a sign, 
But there are also those strange moments when you look at it and you're like, oh, thanks, I, need, I needed that, you know? So um, I think that's kind of the experience that I've been having is I'm hoping for some more innovation, but I also, I see the potential for the human experience to express itself way, in ways that might keep us stronger. Matt, I am sensing a future project for. Uh, oh, I've tried at least three. This. Somebody's got to pay at some point. <laughs> I know we'll have to talk about this further. I'm really my my uh, wheels are turning here because yeah. I, I'm sure. I mean, you bring up scavenger hunts, but I've seen neighborhoods having like little outdoor carnivals in in different cities, yeah. or um, yeah. you know that that reminder of just the signs, or it makes me think of like geocaching or Pokemon. Um, was it Pokemon Go that craze? Mm -hmm where it got people outside and in public spaces where they weren't before. So that's to be continued, Matt. I'm okay. into this. Um, <laughs> but so, I do, I also wonder, like, I, I think this kind of came up and I like your suggestion, Emily, of maybe positing it to the, the people who are in attendance here, where we have issues of access, there, there are like, where are the alternatives? If there are public spaces that people can use potentially safely, but those have certain limitations, and then we're finding that digital things give us some amount of connection, but that has a different sort of limitations. I, I really, I'm very curious to know what will we learn through these traumas? This is how we learn, right? I mean, we can keep talking about wanting to go back to normal or a new normal, but it really is always going to be, this is an evolution. This is a point of adaptation where we're going to have to learn new things and move forward. We just don't know what it is yet. So, it, I mean, we're at a point that's the very definition of innovation here. Uh, it's just a matter of embracing that as an opportunity and charging, right? Yeah. That's one of the things we kind of talked about before, Matt, is how do we take what we're learning right now and figure out how to build a new sense of community, right? Because we talked about that in the beginning, because it's not really going to, it's going to be different, right? Um, a new sense of community, a new sense of access. And it, you're right, it should be breeding this brilliant innovation um but it does it is hard because as with trauma does right it makes it hard to be innovative and community is what makes spurs that innovation so you know it somehow we have to incubate that yeah i would even agree like how while being innovative and trying to create community how do we make sure that it's equitable because i got young people who are not thinking about making art because they're just like am i going to have a home am i going to be able to get my schoolwork done if i choose to go to work instead of doing this and so now we have this dilemma of like our force is paying for internet for the kids cool access perfect we can do that but now we have this way of seeing young people still in this anxiety mode this fear mode of I want to create, I want to create, but I need to take care of this. And I need to do this for my mom and my dad. And so it's like, while we're being innovative, how do we make sure that it's also being done equitably where the ones who do need it. And I believe everyone needs art. Art's amazing. Anyone who says they don't need art, they're lying. Right. Cause no one's going to want to stop listening to music, or watching movies or, or painting. Like don't lie. Everyone needs art. Everyone can, get something from art and so to me it's like how do we make sure that when we're on this road of being innovative that we can collect this data that proves to the people who continue to cut funding for the arts that yo you shouldn't be doing that because this is important and this is what it does when it combats trauma and you use art this is what happens to the brain and then we're doing it equitably because in my head, I believe that it's always been the artist who stands up and says, this is not okay. 
And this is not justice. Justice does not look like this. Equity does not look like this. And as the artist, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to write a song about it, or I'm going to paint something about this. I'm going to write a script about this so that people can see this. So it's always been us. It's always been the artist that has been innovative during these moments of oppression and these moments of fear and anxiety. Um, and I think right now for me, it's as we move and navigate trying to be innovative, trying to create community and be safe, how do I do that so that people can recognize that my babies at Art Force deserve that too, and that it is equitable for them to receive those services when they're just struggling and they're just trying to survive um, because we got things like systemic racism that makes it difficult for them to do anything. Um, so that, that would be, you know, my, my concern too is just, what does it look like to be innovative and equitable and to pursue the arts with just, um, and how do we support and build a community around that? Because even that in itself is hard because now that's a systemic change. Um, that requires a lot of people to be involved in making that happen. Yeah, that's a big question, Christine. And I know it's something, I mean, we're super focused on racial equity and, and what that means and how it, it permeates all aspects of our life um, and all the work that you guys are doing. Um, and I, I don't have an answer. I don't know if any of you do. I have something else I wanna jump into that you said if I can. Okay. So I think um, just just because I think uh, Monica had had this um, series that I saw online um, scrolling through Instagram and it it kind of connects to something that that Christine just said is um, you know art and creativity and your practices the practices of the people that you work with um, you know it, it's a, it's a coping mechanism. Um, sometimes and even maybe heightened in times like these and um, Monica's work that I saw specifically um, Monica you kind of acknowledged it as a coping mechanism it was a series on depression um, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, that about arts and creativity and I mean how again how you guys are using it um, personally and professionally um, and how that's changed for you or so Monica, go ahead and start and tell, tell us a little bit about that uh, series first. Yeah, so I created that last year actually, before all of this, but wow. um, I created it as a way of, well, it started as a way to get out of my own head. Like I've always used art of whatever type um, to get out of that. Like I, I think of it like getting stuck in a loop where you're like anxious or you're worrying or you're scared or whatever it is. Um, you just get stuck in this loop and I needed to get out of that. Um, and art gave me a way to do that. But then I thought, I want to say something about this experience and show people what it's actually like to have those feelings in your body, to feel like that foggy feeling when you're super anxious or the, the feeling of like everything else is happening around you, but you're, you're just there. Um, it's a very strange feeling that unless you've experienced you you don't know it um so yeah i created this self-portrait series using like body painting and photography and i painted on top of photos and all kinds of different things um to kind of show what those experiences were like and it was really interesting because i was creating them while i was going through those things so as i'm doing that I'm getting out of my head. I'm not thinking about it anymore. I have something else that I'm focusing on. Um, and it was almost like a healing process or part of the healing process of getting through that, of um, overcoming trauma and, and anxiety and all of that. Um, and that's something that is really important to me, I guess. And I, I use art in that way all the time now. Um, the last six months, um, like one of the things I started doing was doing art lessons online. And the first lesson I did was like how to draw a tiny cactus. Like I thought it'd just be this cute thing that, you know, young kids would like um, doing. And at the end of it, this, this um, 14 year old goes, Hey, this was really cool. This was so therapeutic. And I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, um, because you're just doing and creating and using your hands and, getting out of 
all this stuff that's going on. It's not in your head anymore. Um, you're just, I don't know. It's like a meditation. <laughs> I could go on and on. But. Oh, totally. <laughs> I think that perspective is really important. I mean, for one of my creative outlets is like baking, right? I like make something in the kitchen every day varying degrees of success granted but it's like that sourdough craze i feel like everyone started making sourdough right there was like a flour scarcity um for maybe people who weren't artists it was sourdough or considered themselves artists i have to use air quotes um matt you're on mic do you want to respond I, just, I mean just to con continue that same idea i think we shared in our in our preparatory meeting, Christina had some things that I think were really interesting about how making is like uh, creates resilience. But um, I, I know that for myself as a maker, when I'm drawing, when I'm doing those, that's not something that I really do anymore uh, in order to be an artist, right? To, in order to share with other people, it's just part of my habit and, and my needs. Um, and when I'm making, it very much is, and anybody who's listening, I strongly encourage, no matter what you think you might be capable of or not capable of as a maker, if you can just commit yourself to spending a little bit of time drawing on a piece of paper, nailing some wood together, mixing some flour and water and salt together, it is the most, if you can allow yourself to lose yourself in that moment, it is so restorative and beautiful. So nice to just be able to follow your own intuition in making a mark and just whatever feels right um in, in that time is a great great place to be um, using photographs and body paints whatever it is that you have available and encourage others to do the same because it's it's i think it's one of the great powers that we have as humans is to kind of find ourselves and center ourselves and be present um and it's so good for us i I hope Christina shares a little bit about what she was saying about building resilience, but I've got a, like a concrete example about how I think that might happen. I mentioned at the top of this that I was building things in my backyard and, you know, it turns out I don't know how to make a roof. I've, I've learned this. <laughs> um, things leak, there's water coming in and it's not good. But um, on the subsequent project and before I go back and fix those things that are not good, I ran into something where I just realized, oh, this is going south quickly. And I knew that I had to start over. And it was so, I was prepared to be so upset and frustrated because I had to start over on something. But I also knew that now I knew how to do it. And it was so much easier to just put it down, move those things away, go get the stuff I now needed and like make it right again. That felt great. That, that recognition of the learning process. And that was like, that was just resilience. I, I watched myself develop it in a way and it felt really cool. And I, I hope that's a sort of experience that other people can find as well. Yeah, I think we were talking about, I was researching the neuroscience behind it, um, behind creating and resiliency and those kinds of things. And it, they were talking about, you know, that you can actually see that like it physically changes your body chemistry, not only either um, engaging with art, you don't even have to be creating it, just in engaging with art, but creating as well will actually phys has physio physiological changes in your body and decreases stress. Um, but also over time, our, the creating the creation of our um, will, you know, helps us helps us process and uh, confront and process um, trauma and adversity and build coping skills that is required for resiliency. And so that was just really fascinating to me. Um, and so it really is more about the process than the end result. Correct. I mean, like I. It, it, the end result is beautiful as well. And it, you know, can help with, you know, I've had artists talk to me about how, you know, they, they are not able to communicate what they need to communicate. So they do it through art and that's their language. So there's, you know, lots and lots of, you know, also important um, experiences around sharing your art, but the process is so, so valuable, whether you ever share it or not. Um, and for an example on that, uh, my personal, um, kind of what got me into it is I had earlier in this session, I talked about my kiddos having um, transplants. So a long time ago when my daughter had her transplant, um, they, uh, the hospital that she did it with had, had a wonderful art therapy program. And they, you know, she, we were, she was in the hospital for a long time. 
and they handed her this beautiful camera and showed her how to use it. And she, tr she captured her, her job was to capture her experiences through photography. Um, and then they put through this wonderful exhibit, not only from her, but other people's perspectives. So you had like this young kid who was, um, who was like dying of cancer. You had her who was going through this transplant and they just did this like, you know, perspectives exhibit afterwards from like the six months in this hospital but it was so transformative from her and she not only did she use that then she started painting and and doing poetry and now she's like studying art and um you know psychiatry you know psychology and what that's what she wants to do right and so it's just um i i don't know how she would have maybe gotten through that experience it definitely i i could you could see the change in her um, and then when my son went through his, they used music and you actually could see when he was having anxiety attacks, they were, you know, just right after in the ICU music would actually, his, his vitals would just drop. And it was just fascinating to me. I mean, like, you know, so then I started, that's why I started researching the neuroscience behind it. Um, but it's, it's cool stuff. You're right. Everybody. Yeah, I Christine, real quick, just, just before you dive in, if anyone has questions, um, just type them in the chat um, and we'll wrap up here. But Christine, go ahead. Well, I think it's super cool that you did that research, Christina, because I, I do research about the brain and how trauma alters and impacts the DNA, right? And it's like, of course, if trauma in itself can impact and um, make your DNA change and, and do something to your brain, then of course, there's also a way to combat that, right? And it is art. Like if there's a way for it to ruin your brain or your DNA, there's a way to fix it. And I know for me, art has always been that, even in the, in the darkest of times for me. So I'm, I'm someone who um, is very used to being angry and sad. And I feel very at home with those feelings. So feeling joy and, and feeling love is so new to me. And I remember growing up, you know, I would write songs because it was the easiest way for me to feel normal, to feel like I was a happy kid. Um, so I, I would write songs and in 2012, I wrote this song about, I grew up in a religious home, so uh, we didn't talk much about suicide along with like cultural stuff, but I wrote this song about going home and everyone at church loved it. And they were like, wow, that's so inspiring. And for me, I was like, I, I wanted to die. And that was my call of saying that I didn't want to be here, but everyone around me was like, that's such a great song. And wow, so powerful. And I just felt like, you don't see me at all. And the only thing that sees me is this music. It's this song that really I can be vulnerable with and can actually recognize that what I'm feeling is, is deep pain when everyone else was like, wow that's amazing. You should be writing more songs like that. And I thought, oh, this is reinforcing to me that I should maybe be a little bit more suicidal to write great music. And what that means as a creative to not be tied to something as toxic as that to be a maker. Um, but it's, it's so interesting to see how art transforms so many people's lives, whether they are the maker or not. Um, and I, I want to second what Matt said, just, just do it whatever it is, get into it and, and do it and, and let it transform your life because it, it can do that and it will do that. You just have to invite it in. For sharing, that's pretty powerful stuff, Christine. And thank you for your vulnerability in it and all of you for being vulnerable and sharing and getting on a panel. And I'm a stranger to some of you and I'm like, hey, wanna do a panel and talk about how you feel? <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> I could talk to you guys for hours. Um, it's crazy that time has gone by this fast. Um, I just wanna share a couple of resources in closing. Um, again, really first, thank you, because um, I think you have inspired me at least in some meaningful ways and um, panelists were, or people were chatting um, and affirming some of the things you were saying. So I don't know if you could read the panel and multitask, but we only got through like, three of the eight questions <laughs> I had prepared for you, but that's okay. Um, if you guys wanna share anything else in the chat, I just wanna share, 
let's see, um, some additional resources that I like to just provide with a group. These are only some of what exists in our um, community, region, state, and beyond. Um, you can see the websites and uh, sort of their areas of focus. One thing I do want to just take a second to point out, um, Iowa ACES 360, Christine, who um, is panelist today, let me know that they just released a 2020 report. Christine, do you want to just give a kind of 30 second hit on, on what that is for the group? Yeah, so the Iowa ACES 360 put a report together to kind of show what trauma looks like across the US, across the state of Iowa. And for those of you who don't know ACES, it's um, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study that shows and proves that if you're a young person dealing with significant trauma, it will alter your DNA. You will have um, negative health outcomes like heart disease and diabetes and strokes. Um, and it's a really important initiative and information where you can really start to see that a lot of people in the state of Iowa have trauma. And what we can do with this in education and information is to combat that trauma by building resiliency. Um, and we get to do that using art. So please feel free and stop by iowaaces360.org. I'm gonna put the link in the comments so that anyone can look at that report. But it's a really great way to see and track how trauma is impacting Iowans um, across the state. Awesome, thank you for that background. But again, these are all really great resources, just some of what exists. So um, wanted to also acknowledge that this was week five of a six week series. Our panel next week um, is same time Thursday um, over the lunch hour, October 1st, and it's making it okay during COVID. We have um, different medical professionals. So Dr. Lauren Patrick is a dentist, Dr. Um, Yogi Shaw from Broadlands, um, and let's see, Liz Cox with Polk County um, Department of Public Health, and Desiree Woodress, um, who is a suicide prevention specialist um, with, I think, Iowa Workforce or DHS. Sorry, I'm getting it wrong. I don't have it in front of me, but it's going to be a really exciting panel. Um, so again, I just want to thank you all for being here today and thank our panelists. Um, you guys are doing really important work and are a good reminder to us all to get out and use our hands and do something. <laughs>